ladies and gentlemen, friends and colleagues, my name is uh, Professor Richard Vogler from the Sussex Law School, and I'm going to be talking today on the topic of future courts and future rights, the way forward in criminal justice. One of the inconveniences of talking um, to a recording rather than to a live audience is that I've had to cut out most of my attempts at humour. Some people would say that would be a very good thing. So I'll go straight to my subject matter. Um, you may have noticed over recent months that there has been something of a concerted, if not a um, coordinated, um, attempt to bring the issue of criminal justice into public debate. Um, there have been a number of interventions that I want to mention to you. The first is the Coalition of 90 Justice campaign groups which reported in November 2015 um, to describe our criminal justice system as structured mayhem. I suppose that's rather better than unstructured mayhem, but it's still fairly um, acerbic comment. Um, they found that Crown Court trials were archaic and chaotic, with victims and witnesses marginalised. They found a sense of otherworldliness right through uh, the system, with lawyers talking in ways that people don't understand. Um, they felt that the whole system was overflowing with paperwork and they noted that delays in trials had gone up from 304 days uh, to 360 days over uh, the last 18 months. And in particular they felt that the system was about trickery and getting off rather than finding the truth and that legal professionals saw the proceedings as a kind of game that they were engaged in um, to be won. This reflected um, earlier comments um, by uh, Sir Brian Leveson, fresh from the Leveson uh, report, who demanded that our, our inefficient uh, court system needed to be streamlined. Um, how that would be done would be through the use of more technology, um, by active case management by judges, including more high quality equipment in courts, body-worn cameras by police officers so that their videos could be shown in court, more flexible opening hours in magistrates' courts, and the abolition of the right to jury trial in either way cases. We've heard similar critiques being um, expressed by the, uh, the chair of the Bar Council, Alistair MacDonald, who said that reform was long overdue to parts of the criminal justice system, and uh, the, the president of the Law Society was deeply concerned about the immediate future of the criminal justice system. And I think more importantly still, in a keynote address on assuming office as uh, Justice Minister, um, Michael Gove said this, the creaking, dysfunctional and outdated justice system in England and Wales is failing society's poorest. Now I'm assuming that's one of society's poorest which is uh, observing him getting out of his limo, but you may feel that um, the fact that it's creaking and dysfunctional and the fact that it is failing society's poorest may have not a little to do with the fact that the court system has been the victim, like so many other areas of the public service, of some quite stringent cuts over recent uh, years. Um, a cut of 30% since 2010 in funding just in July 2015, the government announced the closure of 57 magistrates' courts and two crown courts. One can scarcely be surprised that the system is creaking and dysfunctional under that level of cutting. Um, equally, legal aid fees have been reduced brutally, and the number of legal aid providers has been equally slashed. And in those circumstances, you might feel that um, the poor and disadvantaged have been denied access to justice in a way bemoaned by the, um, the Justice Secretary and you might feel that this is something of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Be that as it may, the justice system is clearly in crisis. A lot of the debates about what we should do about this crisis have centred around the issues of science and technology, uh, about the need for more efficiency and closer management and the need to compel defendants to cooperate more with the system in order to um, ensure that it operates more efficiently. 
um, which I've called coercing defendants. Now, um, although this is a current debate, it's one which goes back over a number of years and has been described in different ways um, by different um, uh, academics and theorists over, over recent years, starting with um, Herbert Packer and his famous crime control model versus the due process model. Um, uh, me and Damasca talked about a hierarchical system of justice. Um, we've heard debates about the need for more zero tolerance in policing and in criminal justice more generally from James Q. Wilson and George Kelling in their important intervention in 1982. And also there have been debates in criminology about penal punitivism and the so-called penal turn, which were very much a hot topic in, in recent years. Finally, um, many criminological debates have focused on what's called the new managerialism, the need for um, uh, a new managerialist approach or um, the, the, the development of those kinds of approaches in our criminal justice system. Now, I think that this ideology goes deeper into our history than merely of recent years. Um, and I would call these demands for more efficiency, more management and more coercion as a demand for more inquisitoriality. That is um, a system of justice which um, has developed since the Middle Ages and which is based upon judge-driven procedure, priority given to efficiency and the ruthless search for truth over all other considerations. And this is uh, an ideology of justice which we have um, encountered over many years and is in direct opposition to the concept of adversarial justice which was developed in the 18th century, primarily in this country but has spread throughout the world, which um, places the, the criminal trial and the rights-bearing defendant at the heart's, heart of procedure rather than the ruthless search for truth. I want to look at the elements of this debate, the ones that I've identified already, that is um, uh, efficiency, uh, managerialism and coercion, and see how they play out in contemporary debates. Um, uh, the efficiency and scientific debate is uh, something which has been championed by um, many people within the so-called innocence movement. Um, innocence has tried to use scientific evaluation of proof, particularly DNA, to show that there have been miscarriages of justice. And they've done sterling work in bringing to light errors within the criminal justice system. But at the same time, they have promoted a very strong agenda of um, the need for replacing due process, replacing the failed system of adversariality with a much more scientific approach. For example, Brown, writing in 2005, talked about crime labs, which he argued could replace part of the function of a diminished defence counsel. Um, adversarial process is no longer fit for purpose. Um, uh, Michael Norton, who was re until recently head of Inuk Innocence UK, um, argued that criminal defence is largely ineffectual. All resources and investigatory efforts should be directed towards defend, de determining whether the claim of innocence is valid. We're looking for truthfulness. And what can, can um, bring us uh, truthfulness but um, science and our new technologies of criminal justice? And central to this debate has been the idea that we can go forward with e-courts and I want to show you what the e-court might look like. It will be something like this. This is the um, ICC, the International Criminal Court's proposed e-court, which um, would have two elements. The first element would be a web presence. So many transactions could be carried out through the web um, without uh, people needing to come uh, to the court. Um, an e-court should be a virtual a web-based courthouse uh, that provides 24-7 remote online access to court services. Secondly, 
Um, a modern courtroom should have online resources so remote witnesses could be um, uh, uh, beamed into the courtroom so that the uh, videos from body cams worn by police could be used and that everybody in the courtroom would have access to online resources and be able to communicate with each other um, virtually throughout the trial process. This would have a dramatic impact upon our notions of adversarial process. The advantages of this are obvious. Um, we could have broadcast quality and um, internet uh, streaming of trials, which would encourage trials to be available to the public, so justice could very much be seen to be done. We could use big data um, in the um, and electro electronically stored evidence in the proof of cases. We could use remote witnesses, we could use body cams, we could use computer-generated exhibits so that we could ask witnesses to find their way through environments uh, on a remote basis. For example, the uh, recent Bloody Sunday inquiry, which has been going on for some time, created a virtual um, version of Derry in the 1960s so that witnesses could identify exactly where they were at a particular time that they made an observation um, on the basis of the city as it was um, in the days when the events took place. And you could imagine witnesses um, placing themselves in virtual environments to show what they saw and what they um, couldn't see. And this could have a tremendous impact upon establishing um, effective evidence in the criminal trial. Um, we would also, it would also allow um, courts and judges and juries to recall evidence, to look at it again, to re-examine it in their own time, and to have um, secure com uh, communication between participants. All of this, it seems to be a fantastic opportunity for justice, not only to save money, but also to have a much more rigorous and scientificized um, trial process. Um, there have been critiques of this approach. Um, Oriola Salavacci recently talked about the colonization of the criminal process by scientific discourse and the concerns that that begins to raise. Um, and she saw a, what she called an epistemological shift of as profound as the move from magical type trial processes, the ordeals and so on, to prototypes of our evidential reasoning in the early medieval trials. So instead of our existing ideas of uh, proof beyond reasonable doubt, we would move over to scientific kinds of analyses where we are uh, determining factual, testable truth. That does raise some concerns about what we're doing in the trial process. Um, and there are also concerns that there has not been much evaluation of this kind of evidential approach. Um, what evaluation there has been has raised some difficulties. Um, Custers and Virgao in 2015 um, uh, assessed the new technologies which were um, being sold to police forces all over the world, um, wiretapping, DNA, database coupling, facial number plate recognition, body cams, drones, GPS tracking, data mining and profiling, camera surveillance and network analyses, all of the toolkit of modern criminal justice, and found that the results were profoundly dissatisfying and not the brave new world that we had hoped for. Um, they noted that one in four organizations lacked any clear appealing success stories, and half of the respondents indicated that they were not performing any evaluations on this new technology, which is worrying. Equally, um, there was a poor understanding and a poor use of technology um, in a study by Koper et al. in 2014, who suggested that the effects of technology are complex and that technological advancements do not always produce obvious um, improvements which we might expect, um, and that police may not be properly trained to make an optimal use of technology. So there are concerns about the way that we're using the technology. There are also concerns about the human rights aspects of technology. 
Some of you may remember that um, back uh, 10 or four more years ago, there was a program put forward by the um, American government associated with Admiral Poindexter, which was called Information Awareness Office. And the idea behind this was that if we put together all of the electronic trails that we leave, all of us um, uh, have been on mobile phones and cell phones, we'll have um, uh, been on the computer, we'll have drawn money out, and we'll have um, had all kinds of electronic um, uh, uh, engagements during the course of a day, we'll have been caught many times on CCTV. And if you put all this information together in one place, we have a fantastic crime-fighting tool which can profile um, individuals and their activities with a tremendous degree of detail and granularity, which could be enormously effective in um, identifying um, people who are likely to cause us threat and cause us danger. Now, at the same time, uh, this represents a most extraordinary invasion into our civil liberties. And for that reason, this program was withdrawn in 2006 um, and was unfunded, as they called it, only to re-emerge or at least um, uh, to, uh, for us to discover that it had never actually gone away in the evidence produced by Edward Snowden in 2014 um, which showed that PRISM and other technologies were still being used to collect big data on individuals against whom there was no suspicion of criminal activity. That all our emails and all our electronic cont contacts could be monitored um, without our knowing it. And um, as you see here, a number of providers have signed up to PRISM in recent years, Microsoft in 2007, Yahoo in 2008, um, Google in 2009, Facebook in 2009, etc. And um, the uh, Commissioner for Human Rights at the Council of Europe, Nils Musnieks, made the point that suspicionless mass um, retention of communications data is fundamentally contrary to the rule of law and ineffective, and that the Five Eyes Treaty should be published. In other words, we need to know what is going on here, and uh, there are serious dangers with this use of big data and this kind of um, information in criminal justice investigation. Uh, this is perhaps underlined by um, the famous um, minority data film, minority um, report film, which perhaps some of you have seen, where uh, there was an emphasis on pre-crime identifying people who were going to commit crimes in the future. And this kind of data potentially enables us to do that. Um, a concern was raised by Lucia Zedner, um, who wrote some years ago an article on pre-crime, saying we are on the cusp of a shift from a post to a pre-crime society. A society in which the possibility of forestalling risks competes with and even takes precedence over responding to wrongs done. So there are serious concerns and um, we should move forward with this technology with, gr with the greatest possible care and concern for human rights and that we are not changing fundamentally the nature of our criminal justice process which we've worked out over centuries. The second element um, in this debate is efficiency through management, which has really two aspects. The first is that um, uh, an increasing element of direct management by judges, that is what Maximo Langer calls uh, managerial judging, um, engaging the judges in the production of evidence and the, um, and the hearing of evidence in a much more um, uh, developed way, and secondly, therapeutic jurisprudence, where the outcome of the trial in terms of um, encouraging people to leave crime behind is much more important than the outcome of the trial in finding facts. I'll deal with these two um, very briefly. Um, 
pointing out that pretrial management is already with us in a, a quite significant way. Um, part three of our criminal procedure rules um, of 2010 provide that judges have an important role in actively managing cases, um, identifying the issues, working out what needs to be established in trials, and judging by the way that other jurisdictions have gone, we can expect this role of um, judges to be increased over the years. Whether we want that to happen, whether we want to move to a more judge-directed um, system of criminal justice, because legal aid is no longer so well funded for having an adversarial system, is an important question that we need to address. Um, there are problems with this. The judge, in, in particularly if the judge takes on a, a role in producing or evaluating evidence, um, has a mixed responsibility as investigator and judge, which I think is very unhelpful. And there is something on a great deal to be said for our tradition in Anglo-American criminal justice of the judge standing outside the fray and being objective about it. The second element of um, judicial involvement is so-called therapeutic judging. And we've seen um, community justice and problem-solving justice being developed in this area over recent years, um, in which the questions of whether a person is guilty or not is really not so relevant as what can we do with this person's problems, whether they're drug problems or personal problems, how do we engage with them to stop them offending in the future? Um, this creates a new kind of um, managerial court which is not aimed at, at fact-finding, but it is aimed at therapeutic um, uh, community justice. And we've seen uh, a number of um, uh, courts of this nature, most famously the Red Hook Community Justice uh, Center in New York. There have been experiments in this country too where um, therapeutic justice um, has been aimed at uh, reforming an individual and rehabilitating an individual drug courts and domestic violence courts would be prominent in this kind of uh, approach, addressing the interconnectivity between offending and other life circumstances. And one can see the real benefits of this, but at the same time, one must acknowledge that um, there, is, uh, there are dangers in taking away the important guilt or innocence role of the court as an arbiter between the state and the individual. Now, I come now to my third topic, which is the topic of coercion, or what I call coercion, which is really about encouraging the cooperation of the defendant with the official process. And this is another topic which um, I think is of enormous importance in the, in the current debate. Now, um, Coerc the coerciveness of criminal justice is a necessary evil. It's about, criminal justice is certainly about the coercive power of the state. We have seen some dramatic changes in my lifetime um, in the uh, nature of, of coercion. I remember when I was a, a young lawyer that it was very common for us to see uh, our clients in the cells with injuries and, um, and having clearly been knocked around by the police. Um, and this was commonplace. We would also spend a lot of our time in court arguing about falsification of confessions, saying that a confession which was apparently regular was in fact um, introduced by the police or um, not properly accredited. Now, it seems to me of enormous importance that this problem has been effectively addressed by legislation and addressed in my lifetime by the Police and Criminal Evidence Act 1984, which for all its faults changed that culture very dramatically. Everything is now under CCTV in, uh, in, in police station areas. Um, uh, uh, interrogations are recorded. There is access to lawyers. And the level of um, violence in police stations and the level of allegations of um, corruption of um, confessions has reduced dramatically in this country in a way which I think is a lesson to many other countries 
around the world. Um, that is not to say that coercion doesn't exist. And you may argue that we've moved to some more subtle forms of coercion. Um, and I want to explore some of these now. Um, the first is the now late lamented criminal courts charge, which since I delivered my lecture to a live audience has been fortunately withdrawn by the government. Um, but you will know it was the intention of uh, the government under the Prosecution of Offences Act um, and the Criminal Courts Charge Regulations 2015 to charge people for um, pleading not guilty. If you were pleading guilty in a magistrate's court, you'd have to pay £180 on top of any fine or victim surcharge that uh, was imposed. Um, on conviction, if you decided to plead not guilty and were convicted, it would cost you £1,000 um, and a commensurately larger sum in the Crown Court. This attracted all kinds of um, uh, criticism from around the world, um, notably in the year of Magna Carta, in which um, Article 49 um, uh, talks about justice shall not be sold to any man. And this point was taken up by Lord Thomas, um, the Lord Chief Justice, who talked about the scale of court fees together with the cost of legal assistance is putting access to justice out of the reach of most, imperiling a core principle of Magna Carta. Um, the criminal courts charge encouraged some magistrates to pay the, uh, and judges to pay the charge out of their own pockets, and large numbers um, resigned in protest. And because of those protests, this um, provision has been withdrawn. But it does underline the the principle that unless you have a good theoretical understanding of what criminal justice is about, any kind of reform uh, in, in uh, aid of efficiency and coercion is acceptable. Now, um, this is not the only form of coercion which we have in criminal justice, um, a non-violent coercion. One of the more crucial elements of coercion is that of plea bargaining. Plea bargaining is developing all over the world. We see jurisdictions as diverse as China, Pakistan, um, and um, continental Europe taking up plea bargaining as a means of handling criminal justice on a mass scale. And there has been a revolution, what Stephen Thayman talked about, the triumphal march of, of plea bargaining. Um, in the United States, where plea bargaining is much more common than it is in this country, 97% of federal cases and 95% of state cases were resolved by plea bargains in 2013. That means that of the 2.2 million people who are incarcerated in um, prisons of one sort or another in the United States, 2 million of those signed up in their own agreement to go there because in the United States, a plea bargain can be made on the basis of a defined sentence. Um, and mandatory sentence minima and sentencing guidelines means that US prosecutors effectively can resolve cases and sentence effectively by plea bargaining because the outcome will be obvious once the um, plea bargain has been made. And Stephen Thayman again um, argued that what we're seeing is the Sovietization of US criminal justice, where the power to prosecute, to sentence, um, uh, to be judge and jury resides with the district attorneys in their offices, who have enormous power in a plea bargaining system to resolve cases from start to finish, which is profoundly worrying. Um, and Langer calls it the de facto unilateral uh, adjudication. Um, this is particularly telling in cases involving capital crime because clearly uh, defendants who are faced with a choice between um, pleading not guilty uh, to capital offence and facing the possibility that they will be convicted and then as a result of that will face the death penalty or taking the safe course, plea bargaining out um, a lesser offence and accepting imprisonment for life. I would argue that the pressure to plea bargain um, 
is unconscionable in those circumstances and is a denial of fundamental justice. It's not just in capital cases in the United States that we have a problem where uh, the average sentence for federal narcotics defendants who plea bargained was five years and four months, whereas the average sentence for defendant who went to trial was 16 years. So really, what are you going to do? Are you going to go with uh, a certainty of five months or take a gamble on 16 years? And it seems to me that these are choices which human beings in a humane system should not um, be obliged to take. Um, and they represent a moral coercion which can be just as effective as physical coercion, if not more so. Um, the innocence movement, um, which I talked about earlier, um, is very proud of the 300 people that they have been able to prove uh, beyond reasonable doubt, effectively, um, were unable to commit the offences for various scientific reasons because of DNA, et cetera, et cetera. They can show that their innocence is clearly proven. Now, out of those 300 people, at least 30, or about 10%, knowing that they were innocent, still plea bargained um, a, an outcome in which they faced imprisonment, simply because it was the safest and most sensible thing to do. And this seems to me to be uh, a matter of enormous concern with the plea bargaining system if innocent people are being driven by the system to plea bargain um, their outcomes because the alternatives are so terrifying. In England and Wales, we don't have such a radical system of, of plea bargaining, but nevertheless, since the passage of the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act 2005, which has plea bargaining provisions, um, and of course we always allow a, um, a diminution of sentence for a, uh, a guilty plea, then we are moving along this track. And it's fair to say that many commentators expect us to move more in the American direction because it is cheaper to have a plea bargain outcome rather than to have a trial. Um, Algae talks about a blueprint for formalized plea bargaining on a much broader scale. And we, in um, a safer, um, a swift and sure justice uh, scheme in 2012, we moved to an early plea system where more credit was given for early plea, even, <coughs> excuse me, sometimes where um, full disclosure of the evidence wasn't made to a defendant, so they really didn't know the full details of what they were pleading guilty to. This emphasis on rapidity and um, pressurizing the defendant to see the advantages of an early guilty plea um, is a as an aspect of inquisitoriality which I find disturbing. Um, and if you take it with the criminal court's charge, um, as Phil Bowen has said, it looks like a shift to US-style plea bargaining where the factually innocent um, are pressured into um, pleading guilty. So this is clearly a, a concern. Um, and we can see this country uh, reacting to increasing international pressure to uh, develop a coercive response, particularly in the areas of corruption, um, drug trafficking, and terrorism, which, um, in my view at least, is beginning to distort our system. We are encouraging this, uh, the international community is encouraging this coercive response to these crimes, and this may be acceptable in countries such as ours where there is an entrenched uh, system of due process, but in other countries, this encouragement is leading to much more coercive means uh, in the pretrial, and particularly um, coercive means which go beyond moral conversion, co coercion into physical coercion. You have only to think of the revival of Yander strike hard campaigns in China over recent years, um, where um, trials were held in, in sports arenas, and we can uh, see that intolerable pressure was put on defendants to cooperate. 
President Xi Jinping announced that the campaign, the Yanda Strike Hard campaign against drug dealers and corruption, um, was going to use extremely tough measures and extraordinary methods. He said that last year, and I'm sure that he means exactly what he says, and I'm sure also that this gives grounds for great concern about due process and the protection of defendants from coercive measures. Um, in Latin America, if you really want to get elected as a politician, you do so on the basis of um, uh, encouraging man or dura campaigns by your police force. Um, that is confronting gang violence and drug violence by mass arrests, not so much on the basis of um, uh, reasonable suspicion of crime, but on the basis of gang affiliations or, um, uh, or simply circumstantial evidence. Um, rounding up people on a zero tolerance basis um, in a big way is immensely popular. Um, Plan Escoba in Guatemala, the Ley Antimaras in El Salvador, and Zero Tolerancia in Honduras. This idea of zero tolerance, which is um, being operated all around the world, is another coercive weapon in criminal justice, which has um, profoundly worrying implications. Um, uh, State-sanctioned cleansing of the streets, um, in order to create safer feeling public spaces is highly coercive and highly dangerous. Between 2003 and 2009 alone, police forces in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro managed to kill over 11,000 people, according to Human Rights Watch. These um, campaigns of coercion have serious implications. Um, and zero tolerance uh, has been promoted around the world, um, as has um, plea bargaining, two different types of coercive approach in what's been called policy evangelism by the United States. There's Rudy Giuliani, who um, has uh, been hired for 4.3 million to fix Mexico City's crime and gang problem, and also been hired by the municip municipality of Rio de Janeiro to pacify the city before the 2014 World Cup and 2016 Olympic Games, with strategies which were used in New York in the 1990s of zero tolerance um, and mass arrest, which do raise concerns, particularly in Latin American contexts, for um, human rights protection. So there we have the subjects of the current debate. Um, use of science, the use of managerialism and the use of coercion. This demand for a more um, fact-based, truth-seeking, coercive system of justice, which would at the same time cost a lot less money, be a lot more efficient, cost less money, and be more effective in dealing with crime. Now, this is a road that we have been down before, and I want to take a short trip back into our history of criminal justice in order to raise some concerns about this. Almost exactly these debates were raging in the second part of the 19th century when the Italian school of criminology were working uh, to promote the same kind of principles of scientific justice, managerial justice, coercive justice, um, which was held to be more efficient and more effective. Um, uh, Enrico Ferri, one of the Italian school, um, writing in 1884, launched a vicious attack on adversariality, calling it a, a grotesque and often insincere contest between the prosecution and defence to prevent or secure an individual. Exactly the kind of um, criticisms that we heard earlier about um, unstructured mayhem. Um, uh, combats of craft, manipulations, declamations, and legal devices which make every criminal trial a game of chance and a sort of spider's web which catches flea flies and lets the wasps escape. Um, his colleague, Raffaele Garofalo, um, complained that a judge was reduced to a state of a dancing puppet with the adversaries alternatively pulling the strings. 
Again, adversariality was seen as expensive and pointless and um, hiding the truth. Um, what we needed, on the other hand, um, as Garofalo pointed out, is scientific managerial justice, exactly what is being called for now. Cases should be decided by specialist criminal justice, just judges sitting alone and in private, who should be equipped with the knowledge of statistics and penitentiary systems, as well as of criminal anthropology and psychology, the buzz sciences of the day, which clearly was um, a way of scientificizing the criminal process in exactly the same way that we are contemplating now. Um, this um, movement was led by the, the IKV, the International Association of Criminology, which um, championed these principles. And Franz von Liszt, Adolf Prinz, and uh, Gerhard Anton van Hemmel were um, very vocal in arguing for the end of adversarial contest and the encouragement of a scientific managerial type of criminal justice process. Um, and as uh, von Hamel said, once criminal justice has been freed, uh, or freed itself of the outmoded, outmoded concepts of guilt, crime, punishment in favor of social defense, all will be better. Social defense was um, enormously popular, the therapeutic approach to justice. We don't want to have this adversarial contest. We want to work together to work out um, a diagnosis, a therapeutic diagnosis for the criminal. Let's forget about um, those issues of guilt and innocence and move towards social defense, treating um, courts as forms of triage for hospitals. Now, it's well known the outcome of this kind of theorizing. Um, Ferry um, and other members of the Italian school were influential in drafting the Italian Code of Criminal Procedure on which Mussolini's Codice Rocco was based. Um, von Liszt wrote a 1907 treatise on the problem of uh, Jewish criminality, and Evgeny Pashakanis, who was a great disciple of the IKV and of social defense, was responsible for drafting some of the early Soviet um, criminal justice codes, all of which were based upon this idea of therapeutic justice, the ending of adversariality, the irrelevance of due process, the need for a scientific, managerialist, and coercive system of criminal justice. Those systems which we got um, in a very dramatic way in the um, criminal justice systems of the first half of the 20th century in uh, National Socialism and in the Soviet era. Those were based upon the intellectual ideas of, of social defense, um, which were promulgated by the Italian school, which launched their positivistic attack upon due process as being an irrelevancy. Now, I'm not saying that the, um, uh, the, the work that's being done now, the advocates of scientific criminal justice, the advocates of, um, of managerialist or coercive criminal justice will lead us down to the dark days of the um, Nazi uh, courts um, or the Soviet show trials. But they do tend in the direction of taking away due process. And due process in any society is a universal good, in my view. And we should, um, we should move away from it at our peril. Um, and we should think very, very hard indeed before we abandon the principles of due process um, simply to save money, simply to, um, to have a more efficient and quicker resolution of criminal justice issues. Um, I would argue that adversarial principles um, remain um, uh, important. They remain the fundamentals of our criminal justice system. The professional, um, properly funded advocate um, in an adversarial trial where the prosecution must prove their case beyond reasonable doubt seems to me to be the fundamental of any 
fair system of criminal justice. And unless one works from these first principles, it's okay, seemingly, to do anything. We have had in recent years some revolutionary proposals for change. Um, for example, the first trial with no jury. If we don't have principles of criminal justice, if a jury is inefficient, we'll work without a jury. Um, the first secret trial was proposed in 2014, fortunately overturned by the Court of Appeal. And it seems to me that unless you have strong and clear principles of criminal justice, then you can cut away so many of the important elements which have been tried and tested over generations. And it's my argument, which I have developed elsewhere, that you need an analysis of criminal justice which um, gives us a whole basis for um, reform. Um, I would argue that this is, uh, has to be um, based upon the idea that the criminal trial is the place in which disputes between the state, the community, and the individual are um, debated and resolved. And you have to make sure that those voices are heard loud and clear. The voices of the state, the voices of um, uh, the community, and the voices of the individuals. And it seems to me, if you give precedence to any one of those, then you're on dangerous territory. If you allow the state with its superior resources to dominate the process, with its scientific forensic analysis, then um, the danger is that you will slip rapidly down the road towards Soviet justice, where um, the state could virtually do anything that it wanted. If you privilege the, um, the adversarial rights of the individual to an extraordinary degree, then you allow individuals to, um, to run the trial into the sand by having so many uh, procedural diverse, um, devices that you are unable to, um, to reach a, a proper resolution. As some people would say happened in the case of O.J. Simpson or in um, uh, the case of Milosevic before the International Tribunal for the Former Yugoslavia. Finally, if you allow the community too big a say, then uh, as you might have in perhaps the Gachacha courts in, um, in Rwanda, or the community township courts in, in South Africa, there's always a danger that um, those courts may be taken over by powerful elements of the society or gangsters who can get the kind of results they want. I would argue that in order to keep criminal justice doing what we want to do, we need to ensure that all of those voices are heard loud and clear and the issues can be properly debated and resolved in open court. And the move towards a more inquisitorial justice, more scientific, managed, coercive justice, is something we need to do very, very carefully and to ensure that the adversarial principles, which have been so central to our um, legal culture for so many years, are preserved. And I will um, leave you with um, the thoughts of um, an academic who was very influential certainly in my generation, that is Edward Thompson, who um, wrote a book called Wigs and Hunters, a very fine uh, piece of uh, historiography, in which he described the ways in which the law had been manipulated by the powerful. The, uh, the Whig ascendancy had managed to write a law which protected their interests. They were able to enforce it um, uh, by being sitting on the benches and, and, and judging everyone. And it really looked as if uh, the law was just a tool in their hands. And uh, having written this book, he was um, sitting in his study uh, late at night, looking around at all the, the piles of photocopies and all the research that he'd done. And he um, reflected that the moral of this piece of research was not that um, law is simply a, a tool of the powerful classes, but it is a universal good, and that issues like due process, which um, are fundamental to our culture, have to be preserved and fought for as vigorously as we possibly can. They are our birthright. They should not be taken away from us by people urging saving money or 
um, having a more scientific or uh, uh, efficient procedure. We must defend those principles. And um, as he said, these are hedges that protect us. And we must wait many centuries before we cut down those hedges, be sure of our system that can protect us um, without those essential, sometimes inconvenient hedges of due process and the rule of law and adversarial justice. So that's very much what I want to argue in this lecture. Um, in order to reform criminal justice, we must have sound principles upon which to base um, our proposals. Otherwise, we're going to die by a thousand cuts. And we need to look at the big picture of criminal justice reform and not allow ourselves to be seduced by the, um, the, um, the very persuasive arguments about scientific, efficient and coercive justice. We have been down this road to get, uh, before and let's hope that we don't go down it again. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.